If you're just stepping in today, uh, we have been spending the entire summer speaking about what we call the Great Assignment, or sometimes along history, it's called the Great Commission. This was one of the last challenges that Jesus gave to us to multiply throughout the entire world. He said, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them the things that I've commanded you. And he said, lo, I'll be with you to the very end. This was the commandment God gave to us. We've looked throughout the entire summer at many different angles. One of them is that uh, it is omitted often in the structures of our church. We call it different things, and but at this level that we're looking at where Jesus discipled his, his crew of 12, but then he had this closer, deeper relationship with Peter, James, and John, and then this best friend relationship with John. We see this in the life of Paul as he invested in Timothy. We see this in the life of David as he invested in Jonathan and had these close, close interwoven relationships. Someone asked me this past week, When do you think this all began? Do you think it began in John chapter 3 when Jesus sat down with Nicodemus? Or was it John chapter 4 when Jesus sat with the woman at the well? And I said, well, if you consider that same book, which was the best friend of Jesus, by the way, John, when you consider that book and you trace it back to the history, John's story begins like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word, Jesus, was with God. That's when it began. We find just 18 verses later in the Gospel of John that no man has ever seen God except the only begotten, who's Jesus, who is in the bosom of the Father. So how long has this intention and design of God to get this close been going on since eternity passed? It is tough for us as human beings to even envision eternity future, much less eternity past. We are caught in this little bubble of time. And I say a little bubble of time, sometimes time seems like it moves so slowly, but in eternity, we'll look back and it will be like one little water drop on your windshield this afternoon because eternity is so vast and so broad. And so, It began, this relationship, this deeper relationship came from a creator that began in eternity past. At the same time in eternity past, there was a drama that was appalling that unfolded in eternity past. God, in all of his glory, had residence of this place that we call heaven. And in that, in, in the, the residence of heaven, there were ranks of angels with a position, a God-given position, to one of the highest of order by the name of Lucifer. Lucifer, by the way, his name, I know we've made scary horror movies out of, of that name, but Lucifer actually means bearer of light. We are, by the way, image bearers, and so was Lucifer. That was the intention. He was to, we were told in the Bible that God is light and he was supposed to bear that, that light. He was opulent in beauty, powerful in his abilities, and yet he was not equal to God. And because of that, one day, one moment, a secret envy and jealousy began to metastasize within him And he wanted to be something other than he was. He wasn't satisfied with who he was, what he could do, or what he had become. He wanted more. He recruited a third of the angels and influenced them in a clandestine overthrow plan. Because of this, he declared a war for more. He influenced them, all of these angels, a third of the angels were told in the book of Revelation. It could have been 10,000s upon 10,000s angels, so we know that he is by nature an influencer, and he had uh, influenced them to the place that they joined the coup attempt of God. We find this dialogue going in eternity past, which I know is profound. We're starting on a profound note today of eternity past. God speaking to Lucifer in Isaiah 14, you said, listen carefully, 
in your heart. This is where it always begins in silence, in privacy, behind the, 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 the security wall, as we would say in, these, in this digital age. It began behind his wall, and some, this secret envy of, of wanting more began to grow. You said, God said to Lucifer, you said in your heart, I will ascend. I want you to see every one of these five words is about getting higher and getting more and more. I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly and the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the cloud. Listen carefully. Lucifer said, I will make myself like the most high. He influenced a third of the angels in heaven to buy into this plan. But what started in heaven did not end there. Lucifer was expelled to the earth, to the planet, and he found a new beachhead. And that beachhead wasn't just the planet, that beachhead was the human heart. He was now on a second mission. The second mission was not only to influence the angels that he had brought with him, but to influence the human heart. We enter into the Garden of Eden and we see the exact thing happen that was happening in eternity past was now happening in our little bubble of time. When you look through these lenses in the scripture, you see this theme, wow, there it is again, there it is again, there it is again. In the garden, in, in Genesis chapter 3, we see the temptation, the attempted influence, and the successful influence of Eve, and then subsequently Adam. The serpent, now in Lucifer in this form, said to the woman Eve, Hey, when you eat this forbidden fruit, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and there it is again. You will be like God. It's the thing that you don't have. There's more. The temptation is there's more. You will be like God, knowing God and good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good, see, she could be more. Now she could have more, good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes. She could enjoy more, and that the tree was also be to desire to make one wise. She could know more. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also needed to influence more. She now took on the image of her enemy rather than the image of her creator. And she began to be an influencer. She also gave to some of her husband who was with her and he ate. When Eve plucked the fruit that day, mysteriously there was detonated in human hearts across all of history, this war for more. We were now had part of our nature to want more, more possessions, more power, more position, more pleasure, to be more, to have more, to do more. We had now in our system, we wanted more uh, approval. We had more appetite. We had more ambition. And on this earth, as we look at this, the, we see that everyone was involved. No one could avoid the draft into this war for more, including God's people. Right as you turn the page from the Garden of Eden, when at now as, as Lucifer and his angels were expelled from heaven, Adam and Eve were now expelled from paradise, and they were put out. You turn the page, and we find in Genesis chapter 4 that Cain wanted to keep more. You turn two pages later, we begin the story of Noah. And in those days, violence filled the earth and everyone killed for more. And God looked at history and he had to utter these two words, no more. We've got to start over. So God flooded the earth. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, for example, 
the Lord saw that wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every single inclination of the thoughts, there it is again, behind the security wall of their heart was only evil continually. And God said, no more. I've got to step in. And he flooded the earth. When Noah stepped off the ark, now we're at Genesis chapter 9. God said that he gave to Adam, uh, to Noah, the same command that Jesus gave to us in the Great Commission. Go and multiply across the entire world. We find something deep and profound in this moment. And in Genesis chapter 8, right before we get to this, this story in chapter 9, Watch what happens when uh, Noah walks off the boat because he was the only one walking with God. In Genesis 8.20, Noah built an altar to the Lord. It's very similar to what we did this morning in our baby dedication. We built an altar before the Lord and we said, God, we want you to be first in these families, in these children, in our church family, in the friends and family. We want God to be first. Noah stepped off the boat and he demonstrated something that no one had demonstrated in his generation, that God was more than anything else. Now, what's interesting, we're going to take a turn here, and we're going to go into something that may seem a little odd to you. But the pictures of the Old Testament, I've said it many times, the Old Testament is often difficult to understand, but it is written like a picture book. And there are images and symbology that gives us an idea of how to live in this time, in this age. Watch what happens in Genesis Genesis, uh, 9 when he steps off the boat. He builds an altar. Now we find altars throughout the the scripture. When Moses came off the mountain in Exodus uh, chapter 20 with the Ten Commandments, this is what we read in Exodus 20. Make an altar, God said to Moses, just like he had with Noah. If we can go to that next scripture verse, thank you. Make an altar of earth. In other words, I don't want it to be fancy because in that day they began to uh, make these elaborate altars to false gods. He said, I want you to make an earth, uh, an altar of earth, of dirt. Because we're, we do, I'm not here to elevate man, humans, but I'm here to elevate myself, God has said, to, for you to elevate me. Make an altar of earth formed for me and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. Wherever I cause my name to be honored, this was the purpose of multiplying in the earth. It wasn't just to have more children. Again, these families that came up, it's not just about having more children. It's about having more people who will influence for God in a culture that desperately needs him. And so in this moment, we really, now we see why God told Adam to multiply. Now we see why God told Abraham to multiply. Now we, told, we see why God told Noah to multiply, not just to multiply and, and occupy the place, but multiply with people that will honor the name of God because we have an enemy who's in trying to influence to do the exact opposite and make a name for ourselves rather than a name for God. Wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stones, I told you to make an altar of dirt, but if you decide to make an altar of stones, here are some directions. Do not build it with dressed stones. That means chisel them and carve them and these elaborate things. For you will defile it if you use a tool on it. And do not go up to my altar on steps, lest your nakedness, which is a reminder of the garden of the exposure of us trying to elevate ourselves, our nakedness will be exposed on it. Okay, let me take a breather because I know this is like this is heavy. All right. In other words, what God was saying is, when you come to worship me, there is nothing more. There's not more elaboration. 
There's not more add-ons. There's not more uh, uh, subtract. There's nothing more. Make that altar raw. And I want you to make it of stones that God is saying that I made that are not enhanced by any human effort. I just want it to be raw. And if you make them that, that tower up, you know, you're going to walk. The priest is going to walk up. Later, they did have some steps like in the temple. But by that time, the priest, by the way, were wearing undergarments. And But in this, this moment, when God is speaking to, to, to Moses, he's saying, no, you're going to expose yourself physically, but I propose to you that you're also going to expose yourself spiritually, that you're building these elaborate altars, and what's exposed is that you're really doing it for yourselves. God said, man, I just want this to be just so raw. I want it to be me. I want it to be natural. We find this in Deuteronomy chapter 27, the last book that Moses wrote. You are to build there an altar in the in promised land to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. And once again, you must not use any iron tool on them. You shall build the altar of the Lord your God. Watch, I want you to file this with uncut stones. Now, I told you, like, hey, where are we going with this thing? And what in the world does this have to do with discipleship? Nothing. I just found it interesting. No, I'm just I'm kidding. When we look then and turn just two more chapters, the influencer is back. His job didn't stop, as we know, at the Garden of Eden when it was closed for business. His job of influencing kept going. And over time, after Noah stepped off the, the, the ark and built an altar of dirt, the influencer was back. We park today in Genesis chapter 11, only 11 chapters into this significantly large book, and we find it again. The same thing that happened in eternity past, the same thing that happened in the Garden of Eden, the same thing that happened with Cain, the same thing that happened with Noah's generation. It's almost like we could entitle this next chapter, well, here we go again. In Genesis chapter 11, we find what we call the Tower of of Babel. In chapter 11, verse 2, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar, which is the same as Babylon. They found a plain in Babylon, and watch, they settled there. Now, keep in mind that just two chapters earlier, God had told Noah, I want you to multiply. But now we're doing the exact opposite. Even when you look at the good intentioned disciples, when Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples, I want you to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the world. Things were going so well in Jerusalem that they grew by thousands that God had to disrupt that gathering by the martyrdom of Stephen. So in Acts chapter 8, they were scattered, finally getting the job done. Here we are again. Keep to yourselves. Don't multiply. That was the influence. And when you look at what God wanted, God, they wanted what they wanted more than what God wanted. Watch this. This is stunning. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks. Those are carved, handmade, man-made structures. I find it interesting. Why would God put the, the more you study the, the word of God, the, the, we're going to spend eternity like, oh my goodness, there, there's something amazing in the Bible. I mean, I believe that we've just know this much and it's good. Why would God put that detail that they, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Watch this. They use bricks instead of stone. They made handmade man-carved pieces of clay, basically, instead of stone, which is stronger, more sturdy, and God-made instead of man-made. You're like, well, that's just a detail. Oh, no. God didn't waste any ink when he wrote the Bible. These symbols are there. In other words, this whole operation of, the, of, of, of what 
was happening at the Tower of Babel was elevated. It was against multiplying. It was all gathered in one place and it was man-made and not God-made. Let us make bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. Uh, for mortar. So when you go to the next verse, here's the motive. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that ascends, do you remember the word, in eternity past, reaches to the heaven so that we may make a name for ourselves. Not a name for God, which God said to, to, to Moses. He said that to Adam. He said to, to Noah, but let's make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Way to go. I did a little study this past week on bricks. I know, it seems like a waste of time. The reason that we're having this conversation today in the midst of a conversation about disciple making may cause a question mark. Let me now explain. One of the greatest obstacles that we have to disciple making, and I'll remind you, that less than 5% of the American evangelical world is involved in a strategic, intentional level of disciple making. Less than 5%. Somewhere along the line, somebody has to ask the question, why? And I'll propose to you that we, as human beings, and especially living in an American culture, are making bricks of more that we are building our lives in such a way that there's always more. There's more possessions. There's more enjoyment. There's more entertainment. I, God knows that I know more work to do. And because we've been clobbered and we are casualties of this war for more in which we live, we often don't have the time to scatter, to multiply in the name of of Jesus to invest in others. This war for more is so insidious, so silent, that as, I, as a pastor of 42 years, may I say that the church is not exempt from being a casualty of the war for more. More programs, more people, more buildings, more property, more possessions. More, 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 more where God said, Will you stop and do no more than what I ask you to do? Go and make disciples. Build an altar of rawness. Come back to rawness, God would say. Don't elevate yourself. That's why we've seen, I can't tell you, I, I'm sure that when you hear of leaders, pastors that are, fallen morally across our country that it's that it hits you i i i don't know if it hits you it depends on how much you follow i have followed men and pastors in this country deeply i mean deeply and read their books and listened to all their podcasts and i look at every single one of them and there there nothing wrong with a building and construction but every almost every single one of them it's the, by appearance got caught up in more. And somewhere the sanctity of their marriage wasn't enough. They needed more. They needed more pleasure, more fulfillment, more programs, more buildings, more reputation, more popularity. And God would scream from heaven, no more, no more. Let's get back to the essence and don't build a name for yourself. Build a name for God who created this whole operation. That's what God is calling us to. Perhaps you're not familiar with church and you think you see a lot of flaws. There are, there are a lot of flaws. But Christ still loves his church and died for it and still has hope that will come back to an altar of stone and dirt. Amen. It's interesting, in this past week, 
I was fascinated with the walls of Jericho. And uh, it's a crazy story that God fought this war for more with this supposedly formidable, impenetrable wall that was built, and yet all he used was trumpets to bring the walls down. But what's interesting is that when those that excavated at that site, what they found was that there was a stone foundation. But on top of the stone foundation, there was just piles and piles and piles of bricks. They thought that they could short circuit a strong wall by using cheap bricks instead of stone. Oh, they had a stone foundation like we do as Christ followers. But what are we building on the stone foundation? And if our lives are just building handmade, man-made, shallow bricks, then all it will take is just a little bit for those walls to be crumbling down. At the end of our lives, we must ask ourselves, what kind of altar did we build? What kind of wall were we building throughout life? And was it a wall where it was sturdy and based on the rock of ages? Or was it built only on man-made bricks? It's stunning. Jesus came and he said to us, more is not always better. He said to Martha in the kitchen, more is not always better, sis. More is not always better. But listen to watch. Jesus showed us a better more. In the, in the midst of this war for more, Jesus comes and he sits more close. He talks more openly. He shares more of his heart. He cares more. He looks more intently. He moves more intimately. He moves more slowly. He moves more deeply. He talks more vulnerably. And all of these things he modeled for us to show us that we can actually look more like Christ. Jesus comes and he says to us, there's a better more. And we close today in a in a very odd scenario, Jesus was on top of mountains and on the sea and in many beautiful places. But the essence of what we've been talking about today is found in the kitchen with Martha. And he's having this conversation with her because she wanted more. Oh, she cooked more food because there were going to be more people. And as the cook as the chef, she wanted to be have more reputation. Wow, look what you've done. Look what you've made. Look at your home. She probably cleaned more that day. She probably put more away. She probably went to the store and bought more. She may have dressed differently. She dressed more differently that day because people were coming to her and coming to her home, and she wanted to have more relationship and reputation perhaps with her guest. And in the kitchen, Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're so worried and upset about more things and many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen a better more. And she sat at the feet of Jesus and he said that I will not take away. As we close today, it's an intensely focused message in the midst of a collection of conversations about disciple making. We've proven as a church culture that more is not better, but there is a better more. We've proven in our lives that we're all influenced and lured into the treacherous waters of more and this war of more, of building walls of bricks rather than altars of stone. I think the message for us is to get back to the rawness of the assignment, 
Just go and make disciples. It doesn't require a building, a program, property, possession. It just requires your person. And that is what God has made. Let me pray. Father, thank you for such an incredible picture that you've graciously given to us in bricks and stone and dirt today. What's happening behind the scenes in super, the supernatural world is so far beyond what we could ever wrap our human minds around in this bubble of time in which we exist. For that reason, God, we need an outside voice, and that's you. To feed us glimpses of not only eternity future, but eternity past. And today, in this more serious overtone of a message, we recognize, God, that there is an undertow of influence from your adversary and ours to want more, to be more, to do more, to possess more, to build more. And often, God, those things tower high and look attractive, but they will tumble down by your power to the stone foundation. So, Father, if we have said to ourselves and to others, I'm just too busy, I'm in pursuit of other things, God, would you recalibrate us today and say these two words that are sobering, no more, no more, no more bricks, no more wasted time, no more excuses, no more reasons, no more man-made reasons. Because all of us, God, are living on this timeline. We're right before our last breath. We'll hear these words. No more time. Help us to feel that urgency today, God. And lay altars of stone to take the time to do exactly what you've called us to do. To build disciples. To grow disciples, to multiply disciples, to make disciples. We pray for those, God, who are maybe tuned in online or perhaps even sitting in this room that are trying to figure this whole thing out between us and you. They've come, they're perhaps they're, they they're, have questions in their mind about who you are, who they are, and how it all fits together. And we're reminded today that Jesus is the missing piece of a puzzle that sometimes seems confusing. As culture teaches us to build higher towers in order to reach you, bricks of religion, bricks of changing behavior so that we get your your approval, you teach us something else differently in Jesus, something more that we can't love you enough, we can't try enough, we can't become religious enough for you to love us back because you've already loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son to die for us on that cross, that whosoever believes on him may not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you, God, for reminding us that your plan is Jesus coming to us as rescuer, as savior, to die on a cross, to build a bridge between our brokenness, our sinfulness, our imperfection and you. You just invite us to come by faith and put our trust in Christ. During this time of prayer, again, whether you're sitting in the room, you're at home, maybe you're listening later, you're out for a walk or a run or in your cubicle. It doesn't matter where you are, where you're sitting. It doesn't have to be a sacred place, so to speak, what humans would call sacred. Every space is sacred when you're speaking with God and aware of him. God is inviting you. It sounds trite, perhaps, and cliche, but there's a deeper meaning. God wants you. He created you. Just like these children we saw early in our service, 
God created these children to have a relationship with him, and he has you too. But there's a gap between you and God. When you lay your head down on the pillow, you know that. That's why we try harder and get more religious and do all those things. But the good news is that Jesus has reached to you, and the offer is this, come to me. All that you are heavy, laden, weighted down with all of these things of the world and trying to do better, Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. You'll have peace like you've never had because you will have settled the gap between you and God for eternity. Here's your first move, if I were you. Acknowledge your need. God, I need you. I really need you. I don't understand all this, but I know I need you. And I wonder if that's how you would begin this prayer between you and God. Build an altar of dirt right there in front of you. The name Adam is actually dirt, it's earth. So between you and God and your internal altar, build an altar right now. Speak to God, God, I need you. In fact, I'm, I'll be more specific. God, I need a savior because I am broken, I'm imperfect. And I know instinctively that you're not, that you are perfect, you're not imperfect. The Bible says that Jesus, who knew no sin perfect, became sin for us on that cross so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, this takes us to the second thing. Not only I need a Savior, but I trust in Christ. Don't trust in yourself. To build a name for yourself like we saw there at Babel. But trust in Christ. He's the only one who died for you. He's the only one that could die for you. And finally, God calls us to wrap back around to him and do a 180 and say, God, I've been leading my life. This is my natural born life. I want a supernatural born life. Would you breathe new life into me? A new birth from the inside out. God, I need you. I need a savior. I trust in Christ alone. And I'm asking you, God, to breathe new life into me. Would that be your prayer? See, that's the invitation. Nothing religious, no work required. He just wants your heart of trust. Father, thank you again for this day, for this marvelous, tremendous, profound picture of, that you've given to us of of our journey here on earth. We love you, God. We want to walk out of these doors and multiply and build a name for our God. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.